Welcome to today's rebroadcast podcast number 55 titled The Spirituality of Harnessing the Power of Prayer with Mike from COT on the End Generation Project, original air date March 25, 2024. Join us as we explore daily excellence with renowned speakers, studying topics such as biblical eschatology, recovery from addiction, and alcoholism. Today's episode is hosted by Michael from Council of Time as he uncovers the latest global insights. We're privileged to deliver daily insights from Michael, a prominent Christian figure renowned for his focus on end-time prophecies and readiness. For further enlightenment, please visit the Council of Time website linked below. Our commitment extends to providing truth, hope, and aid to individuals grappling with addiction and searching for spiritual guidance. Your backing propels our mission, enabling us to steer individuals towards truth, sobriety, and preparedness for the trials ahead. Discover exclusive content on our new End Generation Project Locals community, tailored for our EGP family. With many exclusive features, be sure to watch until the end and take the quiz we have prepared for this episode. Stay tuned for more details. Lastly, immense gratitude for contributing to the success of the End Generation Project. Okay, now, before we get into today's rebroadcast podcast, The Spirituality of Harnessing the Power of Prayer, Episode 55. Let us say that this channel is growing at an incredibly fast pace, revealing the hunger believers seek in these end generation times. What a blessing that the Most High is using us for that extra reach around the world as our content is translated into 12 plus languages. As we journey together, we're committed to maintaining this podcast ad free. Your subscription enables us to do this full time. Please remember to subscribe, like, and message us for daily excellence in our life. We love hearing from you and the so many fantastic stories. We love all of you. Now, time for today's podcast, The Spirituality of Harnessing the Power of Prayer, in Generation Projects Rebroadcast Podcast Number 55, with Mike from COT. Blessings to all. 20. 21 is quite eye-opening. It will take about two days to get through 21. Sometimes, a change in a frame of mind with the absolute truth, it can do wonders. And chapter 21 will. Now that's given all of what Revelation talked about. All of what will take place, right? Right now, you're in one of the most opportunistic times that anybody could be in. I want to ask you guys something. The prophets spoke about the days we live in. Many prophesied about the days we live in. Many have. The world, its policies, are surely based on iniquity right now. Seldom, seldom do you hear anybody say that Jesus has empowered them to get any job done. You don't hear that from leaders. What you do hear is self-empowerment. You hear that message all the time, right? So in essence, the world has moved away from respect and fear of the Creator. Fear, not in the terms of being scared, right? but fear as far as reverence. They've moved away from that. Right? Men take all credit for whatever they accomplish. They do. It's probably why I don't like credit. Because I won't be a part of that. But the world has moved away from the idea of being part of the creation. So they've also lost sight. And as science evolves... Men distance themselves away from the idea of the creator. Right? Thinking within themselves that they have the answer. I want to remind you. I want to remind you. That in the time of Christ. Many of the priests and Pharisees and all those guys. They had the answer too, right? No, they didn't. They were spiritually blind. They had all the people coming to them. They had the answer. They interpreted what God was saying, what God wanted, and they would tell the people what God wants is this and what God wants is that, yet they were spiritually blind. 
And Christ said they did not know the Father. Think about that. We have the same thing happening right now. Same thing happening right now. You know, as you listen to a myriad of speeches around the world, as you listen to those who are secular and ministers, very seldom, very seldom do you ever hear them say, well, folks, you know, I don't know. The Lord has the answer. You don't, you don't hear that. What you do hear is everybody has their individual answer. The problem with that is, if they disagree on anything, right, somebody's not operating by the Holy Spirit. And we already know that God said when people begin to operate like that, Right? They would be stripped of the Holy Spirit and given over to a reprobate mind. A lot of people believe that to be given a reprobate mind, you have to do something, you know, disastrous and continue doing that. No, it's all about desire. When people desire those things outside of the Creator, right, and they continue to push in that direction, they end up in darkness itself. Down this day, the Lord gave us a hint of something. He said that they would call good evil and evil good. So even right now, right, all of us have to be careful to stay within the foundation of Christ. We have to be careful to do that because if we're not, we'll be, you know, taken in by a kind. Sometimes, now I've noticed this in my life, Satan never jumps out and says, boo, he never does that, right? Even in the word of God, the Antichrist, he overcomes people by flatteries. He tells them exactly what they want to hear. In my entire existence, the Lord's word never told me anything I wanted to hear. Never. When I read the Bible, there's always conviction. Never does the Lord prop up anything in my flesh. So it's always like it's correction, right? It's never anything that will support the flesh of me. Always those things that grow the spirit, the spirit in us. All of us are human beings. All of us have bad tendencies, right? We were born like that in the flesh, but we're gravitating towards holiness. Christ is that mechanism of freedom for us. He is not ourselves. He is. It's important for all of us to realize that Christ is the one within us that will succeed in what the Lord's decrees are. The individual will not do it. They will not do it. Christ will. And as Christ completes us, that's the fullness, right? That's why in the Bible it says he will finish the work he began in us. So that means all of us are at different levels, right? Uh, many of us perceive ourselves to have shortcomings. That's okay. Because the Lord, he knows he created us. He knows what we have an inability to do. And he knows the abilities that we have to do things. But he did advise us to do what we know how to do. Right? To do that. At any rate, in these days, we know we have to be careful. I'm saying all this to let you know it's a struggle. It's a fight, isn't it? But it is one of the most opportunistic times anybody could ever have because so much iniquity is revealed. Do you guys, if you look back in your life, look at how many iniquitous things were hidden. How many things you did not know, right, were dark. You're starting to see the evidence of darkness. The Lord said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Right now, you can see the fruit of many things. And as it turns out, many things were not wholesome, were they? They weren't. See, you can't, you, in, in the Lord's terms, you cannot know a tree by its leaves. You cannot know a tree by the bark. You cannot know a tree by its roots. You have to know a tree by its fruit, Right? And the Lord is telling us that at the end of the matter, that's when you find out what is what. You know how many times that turned out to be true in, in my personal life? There have been hardened soldiers, right, I served with. And, and these guys wouldn't stop for anything. But after so many years of engagement, 
Many of them gave up. You wouldn't even, these are guys who would look at and say, there's no way they would give up. But they did, they gave up. They gave up. Now, is that a reflection on who they used to be? You better believe it. You better believe it. Because when you look deeply into all these matters, right, those who continue all the way to the end, those are the ones who were committed in the first place. Those who give up at the end, they lost their prize somewhere, right? Something didn't work out for them to a degree where they just gave up the whole thing. It's impossible for a person to give up with commitment. It's impossible. Because if we have commitment towards our Father, then it's the Father's power that allows us to finish. It's not our power. I can tell you right now, I do not have enough to continue this race all by my lonesome. I can't do it. But in my spirit, there's nothing in the heavens nor in the earth that can make me stop. Right? That's my desire. Now, can I be stopped? You better believe it. Can I be stopped with Christ? No, because it's his resolve that gets us through. You all see that. It is his resolve that gets us through. So if he's the author and finisher of our faith, if he will finish the work he began in us, then all we need to do is continue with him see the importance. The importance is not on how much strength we have. The importance is not on what we think we can do and what we think we cannot do. The importance is our continuance with Christ. Do you see that? Our desire towards Christ towards his things, listen to me. Now that means, if you're going to continue with Christ, you can only continue in agreement with Christ. You cannot be in disagreement. Satan is at odds with Christ. He does not disagree. He does not agree with Christ. Right? When you do agree with Christ, there's something called the Holy Ghost. Right? When you do agree with this gospel, there's something called the Holy Spirit. When you do agree with this gospel, there's something called a miracle, right? It's called a miracle. Hmm? When you continue with the Lord, it is the responsibility of Yeshua Mashiach to keep you going as he said he would. And what did he promise? Jesus made a promise. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody? What promise did he make you? What promise did he make the one who would continue with him? What promise? He has a mandate from the Almighty God. And what promise did he make? Anybody know? That's one, he would never leave us nor forsake us. Now, if the Lord never leaves us nor forsakes us, then how in the world can a person who has is in full agreement with Christ, how can they fall away? They can't. Listen to me. Your agreement with Christ is to walk with Christ. No one walks with Christ and disagrees with him. Because if you disagree with Christ, you're not walking with Christ. To be in Christ is to be in agreement with what he said. Hmm? We can't step into his body. We can't step into him any other way than to embrace what he said. And to agree with what he said is to be within Christ. Do you all see that? Do you see that? Hmm? Now, what does that also mean? It means you shouldn't fear anything of mortality. You know you're no longer mortal, right? You know that, right? If your soul continues, you're not mortal. Only your body is. Your body is kaput. It's going to go goodbye, good riddance. So not one of you should have a fear of death unless you have not resolved the fact that you are an eternal spirit. You're not your flesh. Your flesh is only a vessel. Your flesh is like a, like a branch. Your flesh is like a leaf. Your flesh is something that will go away. You are spirit. 
Remember in the New Testament, it says, now you're spirit. You're spirit now. You're not just flesh. You're spirit now. That means you are immortal. Your spirit will not die. Not when you're within Christ. If he'll never leave you nor forsake you, you're not going to be apart from the word itself. That means you're immortal. You got to resolve this in your heads. Men, men who see something in this world they like, right? Who see something in the world they want to do. They get locked into the flesh. And they want to live forever and they're terrified of death. You should not be terrified of death because you live beyond the life of your body. When your body dies, you continue. You're not going into nothingness. You're going to continue. Here's a heavy one. You're going to continue the mindset you have right now. Think of the mindset you have right now, right? You know how it's all cluttered up with all the, you know, threats and, and this and that. All darkness is going to be purged. That leaves with Satan. But here's something very important. Imagine yourselves never dying. And you have somewhat of your mindset. Is your mind in chaos? Because the Lord, the Lord, with the Lord, your mind does not have to be in chaos anymore. I used to think that was impossible. I was a person who was constantly in a type of mental torment. And I thought to myself one day, I'm being straight with you guys. I said, wait a minute, I don't want to live forever. If I'm going to have the same thoughts I have now, I do not want to live forever. This is just, this is torment. This is absolute 100% torment. My torment did, never came from what came externally. I didn't care what, what took place in the flesh. It was a mental torment is what it was. It was a complete dissatisfaction is what it was. And when I thought about that, I said, I can't go and I can't continue with like this. I can't, I, I wouldn't like that. There's no paradise, the way I'm thinking, the, what I'm seeing and all this, that, and the other. And so I said, Lord, this, you got to show me how this works. You got to show me. And when he did, when he did, right? I honestly forgot I asked the question, and he showed me. Oh, he showed me something. You guys, when you have dreams, right? When you have dreams, you often forget who you are in the dream. Sometimes you're put in a different scenario, in a dream, and it's almost like you absorb somebody else's personality, right? You're just different in a dream. Very different. Sometimes you have good dreams you, you don't want to wake up from, and sometimes you have bad dreams, right? You can't wake up quick enough from, and sometimes you have those dreams you pray nobody else was in that dream that you, you know, right? The Lord was showing me then. He was showing me something. Our identity here in this world is based in this world, right? Your name and who you actually are surfaces from time to time. But absent the influences of this world, you're a totally different person. You're absolutely different. Kind of like a person with uh, Alzheimer's, right? They become totally different. They do. In your dreams, you become totally different. Totally different. See, a person with Alzheimer's or dementia, they can forget. They can forget who they are, right? I, I had for a small moment of time, and it's very fuzzy, but I had forgot. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything but the present. I knew nothing of the past, right? And I remember the, it, it's a new feeling. It's kind of scary, but it's a brand new feeling. Now, just imagine you have no memory of this stuff on earth, of your struggles, of your hardships, of, of evil, of any of that stuff. Just imagine, just imagine you have none of that, right? But you're still who you are, but without the memories, without the, without the, all these memories of hardship without the environmental memories and what people did to you, this, that, and the other, you're going to be a totally different person. In fact, you're going to become who you really are, right? Now, for some people, that's not going to be nice. 
Because some people, even in the absence of all darkness, are terrifying. They are. But some people, some people in life, has gotten them to a degree. They can't be themselves, and who they are only surfaces from time to time. When I couldn't remember anything, right, this world became a, it, it was totally different. It was not as ugly as I once saw it. It wasn't. It was different. It's, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. It's very difficult to explain, but the world was like this place, this unbelievable place with unbelievable potential, right? Now, you're talking about, now, I saw, I have seen the ugliest parts of humanity anybody would ever want to see. How do you forget all that, right, momentarily, and then you wake up and think this place is this, this beautiful place that people are taking advantage of? One of the things I did see immediately was how can everybody have so much and not be happy with what they have? How is that possible? I remember that. <clears throat> when Satan is bound a thousand years, there's peace on earth. There is a millennial reign a thousand years. There's compliance and holiness. Evidently, it's maintained. And then when Satan is loosed back out of his prison after that thousand years are expired, he goes out and deceives people again. Without Satan, people don't operate in deceit. Isn't that something? Without Satan, people don't entertain darkness. These dark thoughts, even fear itself, is not of your father. These thoughts of self-protection, protectionism, right? To, uh, anything a person will do to continue their lives, they don't have thoughts like that. Without the influence of Satan... You are indeed free. Do you know that? You're free. You're no longer in darkness. The whole world experiences this. And then when Satan is loosed again, what do people do? They are deceived again. They're deceived to the point where they begin to go against God Almighty. But without Satan, without Satan, they're totally different. Totally different. Now imagine this. We're about to read something. We're about to read you, about you, all of you, after the influence of Satan is stripped away. After that. And it's important that Satan's influence is here on this earth. It is incredibly important. And we're going to find that out today. We're going to go right in that today. How many, how many of you believe that Satan is not an important element in the earth. How many believe that? How many of you believe that Satan is not an important element in the earth? Not to the point of worship, but for, for I mean, for good reason, he's a critical element in the earth for our sakes. You know, a lot of people, they would say, no way, no way. Well, let me ask you this. You ready? Why does God persist in letting him do what he does? God can stop him at any time. Why does the Most High allow him to continue with us being here? See, God doesn't do things meaninglessly, does he? Come on now. God doesn't do things without purpose. And he does not do things with a low purpose. So that means everything he permits has the highest of purposes. All too often we forget that we're here. I used to hear a lot of people say, oh, yes, God's going to get Satan. And God doesn't have to get Satan. God can speak a word and undo everything about Satan. Nobody would ever remember Satan. Nobody would ever remember hardship or anything else. Oh, he's important. He's critical. Do you know why? He presents to us, how has Satan manifested himself in the world? He is the opposite of the Most High in the, in the earth. He presents the opposite of the living God. He presents another way. Listen to me. Who do you come from? Who do you come from? 
outside of your parents. Who do you come from? Do you have the breath of life in you or the cough of death? What's in you? If you come from your father, it does not matter what environment you're in. That part of the father within you is still going to be within you. No matter what you go through, you're still going to choose him. You know that, don't you? You're still going to choose him. So if somebody comes from a different source, they're going to choose their father. You do know that. Let me give you something Jesus said. How many of you believe that Jesus tells the truth? I believe he tells the truth. I don't believe that Jesus lies. Well, guess what? In the Bible, you read something when people stand before Jesus. And he'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, if Jesus does not lie, and he never knew a person, then they were not of him. Come on now. we got to get down to the nitty-gritty of our walk here. For real. No speculation. Just the word of God. If Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Then Jesus never knew them. Then they were never part of the family. So what were they doing amongst us? Who are these people that won't make it? They are not of the Father. And the qualification, this earth, your life, that's given by the Father, they will not pass that test to end up being his. Have you noticed that no matter how bad you act, no matter what sin you enter into, who do you keep coming back to? Your Lord and Savior. Huh? You come back to your Lord. Listen to me. To Christ. That means you have people in the earth that will come back to everything else but Christ. But everybody who is from the living God will come back to God's Son, Christ. They're not going to come back to Buddha. They're not going to come back to anybody else but Christ. Do you hear me? It does not matter what religion you've been a part of. What discipline you've been a part of. What part of the world you are in. You will always come to Christ. See, when the Lord said, All who come to me, the Father hath given me, and I will in no wise cast down. If God gave us to his Son, to his word, then we're sealed. And we truly do belong to him. And no matter what, you, I'm going to say this boldly, no matter what you do, if you belong to the living God, you will go back to Christ. All of you out there who continue, you, you love the Lord, you're trying to do right, you know about sin, you know how it can get the best of you, you know how you slip up, and in your heart of hearts you're saying, Lord, just take my will away, so I won't mess up this bad. There's no way you could ever say that. And keep going back to Christ if you did not belong to him. See, the truth is you're conforming. You're conforming despite the odds, despite all the temptations in the earth you're conforming. Do you know how many people are not conforming? They outnumber you by far. They're not conforming. Let me tell you what the other people are saying. They're saying, I don't want to do this anymore. When they can't corrupt people, they say, I can't do this anymore. Those who belong to the living God, there's an element within you. And you can say all you want, but you come right back to Christ. You keep coming back to Christ. You know, the prophets wrote about you. Jesus spoke about you. Because Christ is like family. It's like you're in a strange world and you're trying to make things work. But every time you, you, there's a pitfall, you fall in, and everybody else goes scot-free. You recognize things in this world that you would have removed, but they're not removed. I know it causes frustration, but it's time to identify who you are and to walk in who you are. See, when that scripture said there is now, therefore, no condemnation 
to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, one of the major things, one of the traits of a believer is they begin to identify their flesh and they start to hate the deeds they do. Do you hear me? They hate the deeds they do. Why do you think Paul said, Now if I sin, it is no longer me that's sinning, but the flesh. See, we have to go over those lessons. Because he was telling you something. He was telling you something. That means your family. And you're in this place. Now, but you've got to listen to me. We are growing spiritually. But we're growing beyond the lies and deceits Satan has planted in this earth since the beginning. It is not an easy plight, but it's a critical plight. It is an important plight because when some, if you belong to a family and some random person comes up and they're trying to convince you that they're your family member, you may accept them for years, but you're going to keep looking at them and you're going to say, wait a minute, I don't have the same ways they have in them. I don't see this situation the same way they do. I don't like this the way they like it. And then you'll ultimately say something is wrong here. Something is wrong here. Because there's an element within me fighting what they enjoy so much. That same thing happens to you. See, you may have been fooled. You could have been fooled for a hundred years. You could have been fooled all the days of your life. But there's an element within you saying, I don't enjoy this. Some of you could have been successful in this world, but there's an element in you that sabotaged it because it will say, I don't like this. This isn't me. This is not who I am. When you grow up in this world, you adopt your identity from somebody else. Nobody should ever say, well, I'm original. No, that's not the truth. We adopt what we, what we say. We adopt what we do from somebody else. We emulated someone or a combination of people in this world. But ultimately, you come to the point of the calling. And what the calling is, is this nagging voice within you that says, there's more, but where is it? There's got to be more than this, but where is it? You're no longer satisfied with what everybody else is satisfied with. You start to disconnect socially. That's how it normally begins. You socially disconnect. Even your language changes as part of, uh, part of your spiritual maturity. That's part of the calling. And you begin to, you don't identify with what you identified with before. It's kind of like, you know how a person would say, oh, I wish, you know, days were like they used to be. You better realize that one. If you ever sit down and wonder that, you've forgotten about all the horrors of your past. You remember the good moments that you can identify with, but you forgot the horror that was around it. You forgot the stress. You forgot all about all that negativity around it. Boy, how sneaky the adversary is. He's sneaky. He'll have you pinpoint one good time. And you can't remember the pain and the misery associated with it, the displacement, the identity crisis. You forget about all that. But when you think about going back down memory lane with all of it, you'll say, nope, no, thank you. I'm not going back there again. That was horrific, horrifying. That one good moment does not constitute me going back there. Not enough. Right? You're in your best days right now. You just don't know it yet. You're in the days... You're in the days where you have surpassed many different temptations. All of you have gone through a set of temptations. Here's something funny. Do you know that everything you've been tempted with has been listed in the Word of God? And everybody goes through all those temptations. Everybody who goes through those temptations over the course of their life, and yet they still profess the Messiah. Do you not know that you're passing a test? A test that will come upon the whole earth that many have not gone through. 
Everybody has to go through it. You went through it throughout your lifetime. Many have side-skirted the test, and they've got to go through all of it all at one time. Do you know that? Most people look at Revelation and they're scared of dying. Revelation is not about dying. Revelation is about identification of who you are. Revelation is who you identify yourself with. Revelation is the cap of the truth of all of us. Listen, the tears are rising. And what I mean by that, they're not holding on to the word of God very well. I hope you're listening to me. They're not holding on to the word of God. They're becoming desperate. They need to recruit as many as they can recruit away, away from the roots of the Messiah. They need to get you, snag you, and pull you away from the Messiah. They are desperate. Why? Because Satan is desperate. His time is running out. They're on the hunt. And they're not coming with a message of that you think. No, they're coming with the embrace. The embrace of all embraces. They're coming with the answers. But listen, all those who are of the Lord, that means you make it to the end. Not by your power, by the Messiah's power. In the meanwhile, Everything that transpires in your life, you're growing. You would not have, you know what happens to you in your life? What happens to you is what must happen to you. If it did, if it, if it, you didn't have to go through it, you would not have experienced it. It was not for some dark reason, it's for a glorious reason. Many can't see that yet. Not yet. But they will. See, because at the end of the matter, you'll be thankful to God for every second of your life. You'll not curse one second of your life. All of us will simply say thank you. Only then will we have the wisdom and the capacity of thought and mind enough to comprehend what we just went through. But make no mistake, your entire life is like a daydream. And eternity approaches for each of us. But the Lord, he's never given up on you, has he? If you're called back to Christ, right? You would think that is you yearning for the Lord. No, that's your father calling you back home again. You know who puts that yearning in you? Your father does. Like calling all his children to supper or to breakfast or to dinner. When somebody strays, they're called back. And every time we strayed away, we were called back. No one can deny that. No one. One of the best examples of that is this extreme extraordinary stuff that has transpired in the last 50 years. Many people have gone down that road and considered many different things and theories. They have. People have considered so much and they tried to make the puzzle fit. Then at some point the Lord said, hey, come back home. And when he said, hey, come back home, he exposed something of what you were embedded in, didn't he? He exposed it, and you saw it as a dead end. How many saw their hunt of these extraordinary things as a dead end? How many came to that conclusion that it was a dead end? And the Lord called you back. And when he called you back, you said, Lord, forgive me. I did stray away. Forgive me, Lord. Hmm? How many did that? How was your father calling you back? And you answered the call. That lets you know who you belong to. See, if you were a true heathen, you wouldn't have come back. Many did not come. Listen to me. Many did not come back. They didn't come back. They didn't. Since 
1947. Everybody understands that date. It happened a little before then, but many have been, they've gone astray since then. They did not come back. They did not identify with the voice that invited them back. And they went deeper and deeper into something else. See, you may not know this, but every religion, every subject, every fascinating thing is designed. It is designed to pull away anybody who identifies with it. And if it can pull a person away and keep that person, and the person can no longer hear the voice of the Lord and they don't go back home, how could they have belonged to him? See, because the Lord said, my sheep hear my voice. Do you hear me? He said, my sheep hear my voice. And you know what that means? Whenever he calls, Okay, children, you've been out there in the yard long enough, time to come in. We hear him, and you came back. Some of us have come back multiple times. Goody, goody. It just proves the point that in truth, you are the Lord's. Again, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. That's why you came back home. That's not the Lord asking anybody anything. He's telling you about the nature of his children. He's telling you of your own nature that whenever he calls, no matter what you're in, you're coming back. But if you're not his, you're not going to come back. Thus, a separation has been taking place. Just like Jesus said, a separation has been taking place. Because many did not come back. Now it's not up to us to know who is who. Not yet. Not yet. And the Lord was very specific about that. Not yet. But you came back. It didn't matter how many times you came back. You came back. You heard the call. You came back. You know your own story. All of us understand. We know what drew us away. We know that we were absent. From the Lord from time to time. And he called us back. You heard his voice. You responded. You came back. You belong to him. Now it's important to know. Listen. If you know who you belong to. Because you came back. You know who you belong to. It's important to know. How it all ends up. Do you know why? If you don't know how it all ends up, you're going to be easily discouraged and at risk. Do you know that? So God didn't give us half the story. Nope, he gave us a whole story. See, because when you know how things end up, it's going to help you out, right? It's, it's almost like run, run, running, running a marathon. Running a marathon. When you're running a marathon, right, and you know you can finish the marathon, all you have to get through is the arduous run itself. And the thought that keeps you going is the finish line. You know you're going to get to the finish line and nothing can stop you from that, right? Or you already know that. You just have to mentally get through the heavy breathing, lack of oxygen, muscle fatigue, and everything else. But when you fixate your mind on the finish line and you say, hey, wait a minute. After all is said and done, I'm going to finish this race. No matter what happens, I'm going to finish this race. When you know that, you have a goal. You have motivation. Hmm? When you know that. So guess what? God didn't give us just the beginning. He didn't give us a beginning and just the middle. No. He gave us a beginning. He gave us a middle. He gave us the end. He told us what the end is. We're going to read some about that end. This is indeed how you end up. And I'll say it again. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. You responded to the call of Christ. You came back. You veered off course. It happened. It happened. But you came back. Somebody says the sound is glitchy. Of course it is. We're about to have a break. That means somebody's about to have a breakthrough. That's what that means. Somebody's starting to get it. Somebody has a newfound hope. That's what it means. 
Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Somebody's eyes opened up. I'll tell you what. Give me a moment, guys. We'll, we'll, let me um, see if I can get some better sound here. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a small break. And when we come back, we're going to go right into Revelation 21. Okay. I'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT. Okay, everybody. Did the sound clear up a little bit? Is it uh, still sketchy? Very clear back up. I have minimized everything we can turn off is all. Normally we have a different network we're sending versus everything else, right? But I had to, being frugal, had to be frugal for a little bit. And everything is condensed. So hopefully it's not uh, glitchy. Hopefully it's not glitchy. Anyway, Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. I'm clapping, clapping. A new heaven and a new earth. You know, some people use the scripture and they say, well, well, you know, the Bible says the earth is forever. No, it doesn't. No. No, it doesn't say that. It didn't say that. It was a comparison. That's why context is so important. It's a comparison with the word of God, right? It's a comparison. Revelation 21.1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? A new heaven and a new earth. What does that mean? We read, that's right, somebody says, somebody says the earth will be burned with fervent heat. That's, that's right. That's right. So, there's a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. There's no more sea. No more sea. No more water. Isn't that something? No more oceans. No more water. And I, John, saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, Listen to this. If heaven and earth is gone, nothing was spared, was it? Not one thing was spared. Sorry, sorry. See, a lot, listen, this is why you always have to bring up the millennial reign, right? Because a lot of people, this is where they get confused. They'll say, well, wait a minute. If God is going to set his kingdom up on earth, right, then, you know, what's with the, uh, what's with the, um, uh, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And the heaven and the earth are brand new. That's the whole point. During the reign of Christ, the earth is still here. We just read about the judgment. Did we? And that's it. That's it. Then what does he see? He sees the New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. At a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now, pause. Where's the tabernacle? It came out of heaven. The New Jerusalem came, comes out of heaven. And the next thing John hears is this. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. But that's after the purging. After the absolute purging. Do you see that? We're going with, now I'm not going with theory here. I'm re just reading the word. Reading the word. Right? God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Well, if they were crying, they went through some heaviness. Huh? And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Thank you, Lord. Th this is that separation from all the darkness, from all the agonizing things you've been through, gone. They're gone. We're talking about a brand newness, right? That cannot be rationalized. That same newness that you can sometimes feel inside of a dream. 
where you forget who you are. And it's as if you take on a brand new identity. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, You're right, for these words are true and faithful. He said, Write that down, because these words are true and faithful. All things will be new. So if all things will be new, then everything you have ever gone through, it's gone. Gone. All the residue, all the luggage and baggage and everything else, gone. Gone. All things are new. So if you know, listen, listen, you're the ones that responded to the call of Christ. And not only did you respond to the call of Christ, but you did so in a very humble way. Most of us, when we responded to the call of Christ, we didn't just march over there like we deserved to be with Christ, no. Our heads were bowed internally. We came with love and with a humility in our hearts, in great meekness before the Lord, didn't we? Repenting. That's how we came back each and every time. So you belong to him, no doubt. And there's a newness waiting for you. A newness, right? Your spirit is not going to pass away. You're one of the ones that the second death has no power against. Mm -hmm. Some people will die and then be absolutely thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death, not you. Not you. Not you. Because there's an element within you that calls you back to the living God. And if God will finish the work he began in us, it's not you who's going to finish. You have a desire to finish, but by his decree, you'll be strengthened all the way to the end. This is not about racing, running faster than anybody else. It's not what that's about. It's not about you conquering all things in the earth. It's not what this is about. This is about identification. This is about who you really are. Because this ending is for real. For real. Hmm? And he said unto me, Revelation 21, 6, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh, listen, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be as God, and he shall be my son. Let me read that one more time. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Now, did any of you overcome? Let me tell you something. Since some of you think I'm just this, you know, I'm more resilient than most. I didn't overcome a thing. What I did do was respond to the call. And it was Christ who strengthened me enough to continue to follow him to this day. What did he write? I will finish the work I began in you. He is the author and finisher of our faith. But the true decree we have internally to follow the Lord or not, that counts. See, that really counts. And the strength of that desire is going to be shown. Do you know how? But how deep of a hole you desire to part from, oh, especially this test is coming up is when the world can answer your needs, will you love your Lord enough to walk away from it? See, that's coming up. Most of us are used to being led down the wrong path and then hardship awaits, right? That's easy. That's very easy. What about when the world offers you everything? Will you walk away? If the world can grant you what you need, what's going to be your answer then? See, that day is coming. That's part of our test. Now, that's not even the big test. 
That's part of our test. And the only way a person can overcome that is answering the call even in that circumstance. See, that's coming. Just think about that. When the world can answer your prayer, when the world can fulfill your desires, will you still heed to the call of the Lord? That's coming. See, I know a lot of people are calling for financial collapses and things like that. I keep telling you guys I'm privy to something that's just the opposite. They're going to offer people paradise. They're going to offer people security. And I can tell you right now, people are going to make every excuse in the world to take it. Because if a person will do anything for security, they're going to be lost. They're going to be lost. I, but I do know that God's people, if a person truly belongs to the living God, they'll pass that test too. They'll pass that too. See, a lot of, a lot of folks are, it, it'd be easy if it were a financial collapse. Right? Everybody could look at the world and say, yep, this is Satan. Some evil is behind it. Let me go the opposite direction. It's not going to happen that way. Did we not read the book of Daniel? How he will overcome all he overthrows by flatteries. How he will scatter among them the prey and the spoils and the riches. He's going to overcome them with gifts. With gifts. How many people were in the first Gulf War? The very first one was Saddam Hussein. The very first confrontation, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. How many were there? I know that some of you guys had to be there, right? Because if you were there, you understand that the Saudi prince was going to give every single male soldier $10,000. You also understand the Kuwaiti Liberation Medal that they gave you is worth some moolah. You understand that, don't you? Right? So they were trying to give the males a gift in Saudi Arabia. The Army, the Marines, and the Air Force, and the Navy did not take it because they did not extend that same courtesy to females. They didn't. But they stood ready to give every single male soldier 10000 That was the beginning. 10000 for soldiers. For non-commissioned officers, it was a bit higher. For junior officers, it was a bit higher. For command officers, it was a bit, bit higher. Do you know how tempting that was for them? And it took a general of integrity to say no. And it took a president of integrity to say no. Do you know that? Hmm? The kingdom of the beast is going to be something people are willing to die for. Oops. We read about that revelation. How that when the two witnesses lay dead in the street, they bought each other gifts. You can't buy each other gifts if you're poor. I'm telling you, something is going to happen that does not meet the theories of the common man. It would be so easy if Satan were this ugly thing that would rise, right? With 25 horns on his head, big black eyeballs, just ugly, right? It's not going to happen that way. God warned us that Satan will manifest himself as an angel of light. That word light implies an answer giver, right? Somebody who has the answers. Somebody who can straighten out problems. Now listen to me. What does the world call for right now? What are they calling for? Oh, we need this president, and we need that president, and we need the president over here because they can answer all these problems. The world right now is primed. They're primed to prop anybody up who can give the ultimate answer. Hmm? Lord have mercy. Are you kidding me? People have no idea. 
And I know people have heard this popular thing for a long. Listen, I know about popular sayings. People have hinged their lives on popular sayings that never came to pass for more than for thousands of years. They have. I remember one time it got to the point where somebody said the rapture was coming every single day. You guys remember that too, don't you? Every single week, the rapture was coming. People would get their hopes up. They start selling things and all sorts of things. They really get into the theory of who was presenting it, and nothing would come. Nothing came. Because they missed the whole point of what Paul was talking about. Paul said at the last trump, and people had not gone through any trumpet blasts. They had not gone through one, and they were hoping for the last trump to be the first trump. They didn't believe the word of God. They believed the popularity of the messages people wanted to hear. And I continue to say this. God has never uttered anything I really wanted to hear. With the Lord as always, hold on and wait. Is coming. You have to use virtue with the Lord. You have to be real with the Lord. Because you're not going to get that instantaneously. Nope. You're going to have to have patience. That's a requirement of everything with the Lord patience. He has virtues that we have to have or we won't wait on him. But people seem to dictate the messages these days. They want a speaker like me to say what they want to be said. I don't do very well at that. Have you noticed? I don't. People get mad at me and COT is okay. I know they do. I know people don't agree. All the time I know they don't agree. And then they get angry when something that you want to come to pass, that everybody wants to come to pass, when it fails. Like it was a person's fault that didn't believe. <laughs> right? People are primed right now. They're primed to connect themselves with anybody they believe can answer. Can give them paradise here on earth. Nobody wants the person who's going to say, listen, turn to Christ. Turn away from the world while there's still time. That's not what they want. They want someone who can have them play video games all day. They want someone who's going to say it's okay for them to get drunk all day. They want someone who can say, yes, you can have your three wives and no one will say a thing. They want someone like that. Who's going to make them kings and queens? Have you noticed? That's why people want to be empowered. So they can run their own life. And they're primed. They are primed. They're calling constantly. And you know what? I'll, I'll tell you this. Even right now, now I'm going to say this. A lot of people seem to like President Trump, right? The first time President Trump goes against the people. They're going to call for him to be hanged. You do understand that, don't you? The first time he goes against their principles, they're going to call for his head. See, in the Bible, it gives us a hint about large groups following people. In the Bible, it says concerning the beast, those who feed of a portion of his meat shall destroy him. That means partakers of a person, right, who has flattered anybody, those same individuals will be their destruction. And as a principle from the beginning of time to this time, and it will be in the future. All those followers, if your word is not bound in the words of Christ, those who follow you are going to be the ones that consume you. That's just a simple principle. So the first time President Trump goes against the grain, if he does anything against what the people are calling for, they're going to say, off with his head. Don't you remember what they said about him before they embraced him? They said, off with his head. Before they embraced him, they showed their true sentiment. They only changed... Because he began to tell them exactly, exactly what they were calling for, right? He began to, he began to do it. 
Lord have mercy. When it doesn't happen, the people are going to call for his head. Anyway, so, so, a larger temptation is coming. But at the end of the matter, listen, all those who overcame, they inherit all things. They inherit all things. Right? Listen, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and the liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's why in chapter 20 it says, blessed is he who has who has, when he was talking about having no part, right? When he said, blessed and holy is he that hath part the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power, right? And then, of course, we read in Revelation uh, 21, 21 eight. But the fear of unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sources, idolaters, and liars, shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The second death is when you take all the doomed, and they go into the lake of fire forever. They go into the lake of fire forever. All right? That's the second death. Now, those who take part in the first resurrection, the second death has no power, which means they will not be taking part in this. Who are those who take part? Who are those? Who are those who are blessed and holy? Those who take part in the first resurrection. Who are they? They're the same ones that will be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Those who stayed the course will reign with them a thousand years. And who are those who stay the course? Who are those? Listen. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for a witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You know that first group in Revelation we, we read about far back in Revelation on the, it was on the, um, uh, when the, during the, um, right before, right before the last seal, right? Right before the seventh seal. Do you guys remember that great number that no man can number? How that they were before, they would be before God, right? Always. And they came out of great tribulation. Have you guys looked at that term, that phrase, great tribulation? Did you look at what was in the original writings? Because Jesus spoke that phrase all the time. So there's something in this something in your life is called the great tribulation. That's what, so, that's what I wanted you guys to find. There's something in your life called the Great Tribulation. Nobody can make a mistake on this one. It is in black and white. There's an object called the Great Tribulation. Uh-huh. I guess the gear is going. Now, listen, I'm not one of those who will go pick a definition that suits what I wanted to say. No. I had to go back in the heritage for this one. Because the New Testament was written in that Greek language. I had to go back to that first Greek language, the Kano Greek. And there is a something that is a great tribulation that you will come out of. Well, God called you out of the... Finish that for me. God called you out of the... You're in this world, but not of this. And he called you out of the... The world, the world, to love the world is to have enmity with God. God called you out of the world. You've been set apart from the world. You've been delivered from the world. You're not to be a friend of the world. The world. So what is the world? What is the world? Everything that is not your father. 
That's what the world is. How long has the world been here since the garden? The instructions have been the same since the garden. Since the garden, since, since Adam and Eve, since Cain and Abel. It's been the same. And God called you out of what? So what is the world? The kingdoms of men constitutes the world. The sum total of what man has built is the world. And what your father has built is not the world. Because what your father has built is with him in the heavens. What men have built is in the world. And God called you out of what men have built. Because why would he call you out of what men have built? Because he already told us, and we're going to do a deeper study. These kingdoms in the earth were whose design? Your adversary. That's whose design. Would you be shocked to know that Satan has influenced mankind to build everything in this earth up until this very point? Would that shock you? See, it's easier to think that man by himself, out of the goodness of his heart, built these kingdoms so you could have some perks in it, right? But it doesn't work out that way. If anything in this earth were holy, it would not perish. You know that, right? It would not perish. The kingdoms of this world are not the kingdoms of our Lord. They are not. And if he won't claim them, they have no fellowship with him, just as light has no fellowship with darkness. Didn't the Lord say that an evil person can love? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Didn't he say that an evil person and these flawed people in the earth know how to give good gifts? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So giving a good gift, flattering anybody, embracing anybody, showing earthbound love, even Satan himself can do. Uh-oh. Oh, Satan can do that. He can show appreciation. He can do all of that. In fact, how does he fool the saints? Through an embrace, through a kiss. Remember Judas. Judas did not take Jesus captive by force. He led him into captivity didn't he? He sold him out. Judas was the closest one to Christ. Remember Jesus said the enemy is of your own household. What was he, what was he teaching us? The enemy is always closest to you. Closest to you. That's what he was teaching you. The enemy is not going to jump from behind a corner and say boo. The enemy is closest to you. He's not going to work through some strange vessel. He's going to work through vessels close to you to get to you. Because didn't you notice in the book of Job that Satan does not waste his time? He already knows who's worthy of him, who he can easily get to, and who he cannot. And he likes a challenge. The same thing people like in the earth, Satan liked in the book of Job. Can you believe that? A challenge. You know how people walk in the earth? Oh, I just like a challenge. I knew that I know this one millionaire, he likes the thrill of the kill. He does. That's what they call it, the kill. They like that thrill. They like it when somebody opposes them. It breeds competition. Oh, but if people think somehow that's from the living God. No, it isn't. That is not God's way. Yes, we have to live in this world. Right? But we are not to adopt the ways of this world. 
Do you know how many people are listening to this rhetoric from the world? They're becoming just like it. At the very end. They're at the very end. And they're becoming just like the world. They indulge like the world indulges. And they're losing their foothold. And they're doing so willingly because the Bible says they're willfully ignorant of the truth. That means they know the truth. They just do not want to embrace the truth. Mm -hmm. And this world will go into nothingness. Nothing. Have you guys noticed that when you're in the world, your mind is not on Christ? And when your mind is on Christ, you're not in the world. Have you noticed that? If anything were of Christ, when you were in your deep time with Christ, it would be on your mind too. Never has the world occupied my brain when I was deep in the word in the New Testament. Never has the world ever been on my mind. Never. And when I was deep into the world, the Bible was not on my mind. When you get out there in the world and enjoy yourself, why is the Bible not on your mind? It should show you that spiritual separation right away. They will not coexist. They won't occupy the same space, will they? It's either one or the other. And when you face something like that in comparison with the word of God, then you know that whatever it is, that is the either or with the gospel of Jesus Christ, is bound in unholiness. Whatever it is, it is not holy. <clears throat> Somebody had a question here real quick. Let me see. Can you explain Isaiah 65, 16 through 17? Let's go find it. Something about forgetting. Isaiah 65, 16 through 17. Ooh, that one has, let's read it first. 65, uh, 16 through 17 is what the request was. It says this, Isaiah 65, 16 says, that he who blessed himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Now, you have to go back because you have to have context for this, right? He says, in, even in 14, it says, Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for the vexation of spirit. And you shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee. And call his servants by another name that he who blessed himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. Listen, but you can't separate 15, 14, 15, and 16 must never be separated. Do you see that? Th this is context. Because that's a continuation scripture. It says, and ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name that he who blessed himself in the earth shall be blessed himself in the God of truth. All right? So what he, he just said this, and call his servants by another name. For the Lord God shall slay the wicked one, right? And shall call his servants by another name that he who blessed himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. That's a change, right? That's a change. It's not about forgetting. This is about a newness coming about that when that saint, whatever that saint did, in this life, right? Whatever they did in this life is going to be gone. 
He's got to be gone. All that and the iniquitous dealings and everything else a person has been forgiven of that they may carry his baggage is going to be gone. That if that person, whoever it may be, if they bless themselves in the earth, now they're going to bless themselves in the God of truth. And if they swore, swore in the earth, they're going to swear by the God of truth. All things will change. That's what he's saying. That's why he said, for behold, I created new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered. No, all this will be gone. All things will be new. All things will be new. You're not going to carry the baggage around. You're not going to carry the memories around. You're not going to listen. And you know what that means? You're not going to sit there and say, now, I hate to say this, but I have to put it to you this way. Jesus said when they when they came to Christ, they said, well, it was a man that had five wives. Who's going to be his wife in heaven? Jesus said, don't you know anything? Don't you know you're not going to be male or female? You're going to be like the angels, neither male nor female. And if all former things are gone, then all the people who make it to heaven with you are going to be your brothers and your sisters. All things will be new. All things will be new. You're not going to remember a specific person and then forget everything else. No. God said what he said. The problem is people have people have, have these, I don't know, it's, it's almost a total disregard of the word. And they have bought the illusion of men's sayings. Like your children, you're not going to know them as your children. They're going to be your brother, your family. That's what they're going to be. All things will be new. God will, God will do all of that. You'll even have a new name. So if you have a new name, and the only one that knows that name is you and the one who gave you the name, nobody else knows the name, how then are you going to know somebody else's name? You will not. You won't. You will not. All the relationship paradigms in this earth are not translatable. That would void the word of God. I know people say they went to heaven and saw this, that, and the other. I know they do. I have to stick with the word of God and the consistency of it. What if a person went to heaven with a wife, but another person really loved the person's wife? Hmm? No, none of this stuff in the earth is going to translate into eternity. People have had dreams and visions. I believe that God will often show what a person needs to see, right? Just show them what they need to see to get them one step further. That's what I believe. God doesn't lie nor give falsehoods to people. He will often try people to see if they'll stick with his word or go with the fantasy. He will See, he, he already told us that. He even sends a person that will have a dream that will come to pass. And then he says, if that person starts to say, let's go and follow, follow other gods, the Lord your God does that to prove you to see if you love the Lord with all of your heart and all of your soul. All this stuff here on this earth will not translate. It won't translate. The scriptures continue to say the same thing, and it's not going to translate. That goes for pets. See, it's almost like people are trying to drag earth to the heavens. That's not going to happen. We have no idea what's in store, but we do know what the scriptures say. But how long are we going to disregard what the Lord is saying? How long are we going to continue to disregard what the Lord consistently says just so we can have our theory? come true. That's how they couldn't see Christ the first time. They began to believe within themselves because nobody challenged what they were saying. Men became the king of their own word. And when Jesus came, they couldn't even recognize him. The experts didn't. But if you take notice, many did. They said he is the Messiah. How could they even know this? Because they were not. They were not living by their own theories. They were not living life by what they had established, but they were, in fact, in a search for what was real. And when you are looking for what is real, you're not going to take man's word for it. You're not. You're not, you're not, you're not. Boy, we're in a time of time. We are. We're in a time of time. 
But if we don't get rooted quickly in the truth, and God is merciful. He is so merciful. He is merciful. And yes, we have a lot of hang-ups. And yes, that piece of happiness we found in the earth, we want that to continue in the heavens, but that's because we have no idea of the completeness of what the Father has in store for his children. That's why. We don't have a mind to imagine the fullness of what God's throne is. We don't. We don't. So this is our Father emphasizing that newness. He's emphasizing it. Your spirit stays intact. But all this stuff from the earth was for the earth and for the process in the earth. It will not translate. But that you will be delivered fully from all of it. Hmm? Remember that. Oh, anyway, let me go back to Revelation. Thank you for that question, by the way. Think of that question because it says, and if it's us, how are we not going to make the same mistakes if we forget the circumstances? We Nope, there'll be none. Because, listen, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the tree of life, which means everything else was permissible. You're not going to make the same mistakes because there's no influence of darkness at all. Satan will be gone forever. And without the influence of darkness, no one sins. Hallelujah. Now, that's a hallelujah moment. Without Satan, everybody is free from sin itself. No one will do iniquity. And no lesser form can ever induce iniquity upon us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Don't you see what's happening to you? Don't you see what you're about to become? Do you see what you're about to become? You're not going to another country under the same circumstances. You're going to a whole nother level of everything. There is no Satan in that place. There is no darkness that will influence you. None. There is nothing that will overtake you ever again. You will not operate nor function by the same mind anymore. It is beyond the comprehension of all of us what we will become. But I know one thing. It will surpass the best of our imaginations. And it will have no hiccups, hang-ups, technicalities, none of that stuff that people dream up down here. All those reservations that we have come from darkness. We already know that in the thousand year reign when Satan is bound, all of a sudden everybody is serving the Lord again. And when Satan is loosed, he goes out and deceives people again, but he's going to be kaput, cast into outer darkness. Him and all who followed him, they will have no influence upon light anymore. You're looking at something totally new, something that surpasses the best idea of heaven you could ever have, something that goes far surpasses that. I even hear people's interpretation of the heavens, and I, I couldn't settle for what I hear people describing. I'm just being honest with you. I couldn't. I wouldn't want it. And sure enough, in the Word of God, it states the opposite of what most people are used to. It's just that these things are not read a lot. Haven't you noticed when it comes to heaven, people start telling dreams and they won't read scripture, right? Is that what happens? And over the course of time, if you do that long enough, people start believing what, what the dreams that people have had, the interpretations that people have had. We may have had small representations of the truth. But as far as seeing the whole thing, how can the mind comprehend such a thing? It'd probably give a person an instant aneurysm to hold the information in one small segment of the heavens. Hmm. 
So anyway, there I go again, foot and mouth disease, so I just caused a firestorm. <sighs> there I go. I do this all the time. I never say what's popular. I know. I know. That I can't help it. That's foot and mouth disease. That's just the way it is. That's the way it is. My goodness. Do it every time. I could have done without going in that direction, right? I get chewed out and cursed out for that. My dear. Somebody said, I have a question. Jesus said, we'll be like the angels, neither man nor female. The fallen angels made it with humans. Were those fallen angels different than the angels Jesus was talking about? No. They... When they joined, when you read Jasher or Enoch or any of those references, right, to the fallen angels, they became what was necessary, right? The object, a lot of people read that and they say, oh, they fell in love with woman. No, they didn't. They used a female as a vessel, a birth-giving vessel. Half of them ripped up the women. Half of them killed the women, destroyed them in the process. They just wanted the children. When they made their petition to God, they spoke about the children. They wanted their children to have eternal life like human beings, but God said, no. I didn't sanction those children. No. So they could take the form of both male and female. In, a lot, in some cases, some of those fallen angels, like Azazel, he appealed to men just as well as women. Right? So they can become either or. Either or. Female, that female connotation is utilized for anything that can replicate, which is why angels are male, right? They cannot replicate. A womb like Jezebel. Jezebel is a product of corrupted human and spirit with a twisted doctrine, right? And so in Revelation it states that Jezebel seduces God's servants to fornicate with other doctrines and things of that nature. And God promised he gave her space to repent. She would not. So he said, I'm, I'm going to get rid of you and your children. So Jezebel is female, not because of the female Jezebel in times past, but Jezebel has the power to replicate her corruption. When something has power to replicate corruption, it is then female. It has a womb. Anything God speaks of as being female has a womb. That's why it's female. Anything male has a seed, but a seed without a womb, well, nothing happens, right? Angels are neither male nor female. They became whatever they needed to be to tamper with humanity. And those fallen angels who went so far as to tamper with humanity are bound forever. But there's a new group doing the same thing. But this time they're not taking, they're not cleaving one to another, which means there's no physical contact. They're only yanking material from people for themselves. The fallen angels are at it again, but they're not cleaving to anybody. They learned their lesson the first time. So they want to stay in operation a little bit longer. But they're doing that again. That's in the book of Daniel. In the last kingdom, the kingdom that's partly strong and partly weak, right? They will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but will not cleave one to another. And then, yes, some people think those are the sons of Seth, but the sons of Seth are human beings. What we're talking about is not human being. In fact, the Hebrew word, when it says they, that word they is not used. The word that's being used is an angelic host word, something that has something to do with the angelic hosts. So we know it's not human. It's a non-human. Is mingling their seed with the seed of men, which is human, but they will not cleave one to another. So they're taking material from humanity. This is the abduction, these, all these abduction stories that you hear people talk about. And they can't make heads or tails of it, right? They'll say, well, you know, I think an alien took me. And somebody else says, well, I went right into the wall. And somebody else says, well, I thought I saw some military folks there, right? They have no idea what that program actually is and they don't want to know you don't want to know it is the biggest act of betrayal anybody can ever have and if you guys did know you'd be infuriated and all of us would get ourselves killed we would because we would not accept no as an answer it's one thing to betray a nation it's another to betray humanity 
Anyway, let me not get on that subject, but that's what's happening now. And so right before your eyes, there are people all around you that look like you, but they have honed spiritual skills in the areas of corruption, areas of wickedness. And they're starting to come forward, but they have no genetic memory of common things. They don't know how to click the tip of a pin. They do not know how to open a microwave. They don't even have a concept of heating up food. They don't even have a concept of cooking food. So all those things that we have instinctually through genetic memory, they do not have in them. They're disconnected from it. And you've already seen a couple of them, for sure. For sure. The more humanity continues to twist policy, the more they're going to embed themselves in common day society. You don't know who is who these days. Everybody has all this, all the facelifts and everything else. You really don't know who is who. You don't know who's been altered, who is not. They fit perfectly in. They fit in perfectly. And you don't think it was them that started that whole thing in the process? They are concealing themselves through man's arrogance. They're hiding in man's arrogance. So you cannot see them. But if you ever get around one, you'll never forget it. Never. I bet you'll believe in Christ, then you get around one. You really will believe in Christ. Or be totally subdued at the same moment. Anyway, that's another part of the unseen world. And when it's going to be seen, it's going to be too late. I tell you now, when it is known, nobody's going to care. The world will be so iniquitous at that point, no one is going to care. It's got to be just like Sodom and Gomorrah. They'll say, ooh, well, we, let's go and see if we can be intimate with them. That's exactly what people will do. They're not going to care. They're going to be so corrupted. They'll make no distinction between a human and anything else. They're going to be so perverted. They'll have no conviction about even desiring that act upon them. They'll be totally inclusive in this society, at which point the beast kingdom will be full. But that's where we are. That's what we're headed to. But as far as us, your life is meant for full deliverance, not for bondage. And all of what you've been going through is of a high necessity. Can you imagine what you'll be like when you're fully delivered? That's coming to all who endured. And the question is this. How many of you are ready to endure whatever you need to for the sake of your family, the living God, Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and all your brethren? Mm -hmm. How many of you are ready to endure all things to let the Lord know, Lord, I choose you over everything else? Mm -hmm. How many? See, most people are following Christ because they're trying to get something out of him. How many of you would make a commitment in your heart and say, Lord, I'm ready to follow you because I'm family? How many of you would identify that it was the Lord who showed up for you, who called you back home over and over, that he, in fact, is the one that loved you? How many of you are ready to commit to him without receiving anything? Because I don't know about you. I've been ready and I've already done that. My following Christ has nothing to do with receiving anything. And it has everything to do with honoring what he did for me already. He grafted me into the branch. He did not do another thing. He did everything. That's an invitation. That's a true invitation to be family. No one extended that invitation to me. And the families on earth are no comparison to the devotion I've experienced with the Lord and his word. He indeed is a keeper of his word. It is unfortunate 
many know his word through the interpretation of others, and they have not read the word themselves. But that's something you can change. You don't have to have his word, third party, fourth party, fifth party. How many of you are ready to truly commit and truly say, Lord, I accept. I accept that I am family and will walk as such. Not to receive anything but in recognition that you've already given everything. And I accept. How many? How many? Folks, well, we're going to finish the rest of Revelation 21 tomorrow. We'll finish that tomorrow. Okay, we'll do that tomorrow. Good questions, by the way. You guys have excellent questions. But I still say there's one that, that just for some reason they ask the perfect questions. That pink one that was in that room. Is, those questions are amazing. They really are. But guys, ladies, don't let me offend you, okay? Don't let me offend you. I have foot and mouth disease. I do. So I get myself in trouble a lot because uh, that's just the way that is. But God bless each of you. You all look out for each other. Do that. I'm going to join you all tomorrow as we continue in this study of Revelation chapter 21. And I'm sure we'll go further and deeper. And thank you for the questions. Those were truly spiritually inspired. They were. They most certainly were. God bless all of you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at COT. God bless.